Okay, let's get started. It's 11.05 a.m. EDT on Thursday, October 13, 2022. This is a live stream for day 10 of the American Literature One survey, a non-credit pseudo class hosted on YouTube and Twitch that looks at United States literature from before 1865. I'm Derek S. McGrath. My pronouns are he, him, his. I'm not on camera right now. If I was, you would see a white man with glasses and brown hair. I'm opting to instead use a slideshow presentation. While most of what I have to say is already on the slide, there are some details from the slides that I will read aloud. For example, this slide features an illustration of today's author, Con Mather, a white man with no beard, dressed in 17th century English attire with a big white wig on. Last time we started Section 2 of this class on Tuesday, that Section 2 is going to be about how the Puritans formed communities before the founding of the United States. As I said last time, this is not a section to be read as the beginning of the United States. We'll get some more of that in section three of this class when we discuss who has been excluded from the United States literary canon. Rather, I want you to use these texts by these Puritans to see this mythology constructed in the United States to trace back to the Puritans. Like this mythology where they were insisting we can trace back the origins of the U.S. to the Puritans. And I was in section two to see it was so many later writers and authors who saw and heard so much in these Puritan writings that they thought would be useful. We're going to get some more about how people saw a lot of use out what the Puritans were doing, but we'll get to that in a moment. What we started with on Tuesday was a discussion of John Winthrop's 1630 speech, A Model of Christian Charity, in which he laid out religious, legal, and economic groundwork for the founding of Massachusetts. And he did all of that to avoid a mutiny starting up before he and the Puritans even got off the ship and onto dry land. We used Tuesday to also trace how United States politicians, such as John F. Kennedy and Ronald Reagan, drew upon the iconography of Winthrop's speech, in particular, his remark that Massachusetts would be, citing the Christian Bible, a city upon a hill, as this image is one that so many politicians have glommed onto as their icon for so-called American exceptionalism. This idea that the United States was destined to be a model for how to govern. Well, today we look at how, despite expectations by Winthrop, and despite how we try to define those Puritan predecessors to the United States, there was a lot of suspicion, fear, and injustice that also came before the founding of the United States, and all of which is still persistent in the United States, despite how much we try to improve as a country, we're going to look at a transcript regarding one of the first Salem witch trials. This one about Martha Carrier, as written by Colin Matter for his book Wonders of the Invisible World, published in 1693. You can read along on the link on the slide. I apologize for not fixing the hyphenation so if you see any hyphens please just ignore them if you want to read along you can google the webpage wikisource.org and martha carrier and it will pull up that transcript as i mentioned on tuesday's live stream there is now a discord associated with this live stream if you are interested in seeing progress made on these live streams, recommended resources, and I hope study guides that I will be writing in the future, please consider a $1 or more contribution to my coffee account, coffee.com slash Derek S. McGrath. If you already paid a dollar and haven't received the Discord link via coffee, please email me, derek.s.mcgrath at gmail.com, and 
Money is tight for a lot of people. So if you can't pay a dollar, send me an email, derek.s.mcgrath at gmail.com, and I'll email you the Discord link. Let's turn to today's questions. I had introduced them at the end of Tuesday's live stream, and they're going to mostly guide today's discussion, although, as usual, there are always little hiccups in trying to figure out how can I adequately address all of this in detail and with any sense of authority. And I'm going to be honest, sometimes it feels like I'm not getting as close to an answer to some of these. So I've said before this live stream is as much intended for literary fans and students as it is for anyone looking for strategies for how to teach these authors and the difficulties of trying to teach them. So a lot of this in terms of today's discussion will be an exercise I'm afraid in here's how not to do some of this because we're going to show over the course of this live stream how common matter did not meet the expectations of his time period or that our standards for what we expect in law and forensics isn't matching what he is providing. Our expectations are going to remain unfulfilled, which should be a good indication that we've made progress, but as we're also going to see when we keep seeing these terms weaponized, we haven't made that much progress. So, question one for today. Where do you see legal acumen in Mather's text? Or, where do you see him acting more like a forensic scientist? Question two. How should we regard gender as pertains to this text, in which a man such as Mather is writing about a woman such as Carrier? Finally, what is in this text that you have seen played forward in time? In other words, all this talk about witches and witch hunts and witchcraft, where do you see it continue to appear in our current discourse and popular culture? We'll talk more later today about what was with this fixation that the Puritans had on witches. I know I included Martha Carrier's trial during the month of October, the spooky season, but that was not my intention for timing. I'll say more about this as well when we get to William Apis this semester, because I had intended not to have that reading from Apis who was a Native American author, I didn't intend for his text to coincide with Thanksgiving week until it did coincide because I had to delay the start of this twice per week live stream by one week due to computer hassles. It's not that I don't think having readings coincide with significant times of the year is not appropriate. It's that if that is your only reason and this is the only text that does apply, then you're designing your class wrong and scheduling readings poorly. And yeah, I scheduled readings poorly. When you have, in this class, only one text by a Native American author, and that coincides with Thanksgiving week, that's a problem. When you have one text about the witch trials, and that happens to be in October, that's a mistake. So please take this as my disclaimer. I am not interested in using Martha Carrier's trial for some Halloween tie-in. And we're going to talk more about the ramifications of what was done to Carrier. And this, I mean, we're not going to get too far into how Carrier and the witch trials persist in modern pop culture. If I had more time, I would just start riffing on here's how we see it emerge in current Halloween content, how it emerged in some unexpected and expected places. The Marvel Cinematic Universe is invoking it with Agatha Harkness. We have it in Scooby-Doo. We've seen the Salem Witch Trials used as marketing. And that leads to one more point. I've worked in conference organizing, and that required quite a bit of figuring out how do we work this into tourism. 
I have helped promote and manage conferences in Boston, Massachusetts. Part of my work was considering which local attractions to promote to conference attendees to have them attend. The Salem Witch Trial Museum was one such location I promoted. Looking at how Salem has used the witch trials for tourism can be gross, but I'm not going to suggest that promoting the museum is in itself a bad thing. I did learn this week about the memorial set up in Salem to acknowledge the unfair treatment of the accused and the unwarranted ex ex execution of the accused. The park has 20 benches, one for each person executed during the witch trials. I don't get into this into the script for today's live stream, but the accused were pardoned after the fact. This set of accusations against the witches was to be, rather, these accusations of witchcraft against the alleged witches was to be removed from a criminal record. That isn't enough. When you are executing someone, you can't bring them back. When you give someone a penalty, your attempts at restitution are not to restore life or time. They are to quantify someone into a monetary amount of dollars and to create some statement read aloud or put out visually like what is at the Salem Park. I say all of this in terms of timing because I'm really getting triggered down here in South Florida right now. They are commencing with the sentencing as I speak of the Parkland shooter. And when you have discussions about the death penalty, that's really hard for me to respond to when you're looking at a situation of someone who murdered people. And that's all really difficult to then talk about a case where, unlike the Parkland shooter, these people did not commit a crime and were executed based on suspicion and mass delusion. And even calling that delusion doesn't work, as I'm going to specify, because what we have here with Con Matters text is the assumption of, no, no, this isn't a delusion. I'm presenting evidence that backs up my claims when... <sighs> you might be wondering why I included Con Matter here. I'm going to explain later, but the fact that so much of what you're going to get out of this is the concerns of mass delusion, or rather the manipulation of evidence to reach the conclusion you want to reach, yeah, that's why this is here, and based on what we've already read in this class, you're going to sit here and say, oh, we're including common matter because we've already encountered these kinds of hoaxes and nonsense. But we'll get to that. Let's go with some background information. Winthrop gave his speech, a model of Christian charity, on the ship called Arbella in the year 1630. Martha Carrier's trial and execution was in the same year, 1692. She was convicted, she was executed, and so were her children who also, well, if I remember correctly, Carrier never confessed and this is me already forgetting the text we read, Carrier's children who were imprisoned with her did confess. All of them were executed. And in the same year, there was not a delay. There's not an appeal process. It's just they confess. And within the same year, they were executed. Winthrop's speech was literally called Christian charity. It was that we are one body of people. And if our body, body fails, it's because one part of us, one link in this chain, was too weak and failed. What happened over nearly 60 years between Winthrop's speech in 1630 and Carrier's trial in 1692 to lead to this mass paranoia? 
So figure that out. We have to talk about who was Colin Mather. Again, Winthrop gave a speech on the Arbella in 1630. Mather was born 33 years later in 1663. He was born in what we now call the United States. He was born in Boston in the Massachusetts Bay Colony or company, whatever you want to call it. So already there, we have one significant difference, which has to do with where you were born. Winthrop was born and raised in England. He railed against inequality in economics, unfair taxation. He was upset with rampant poverty, but he understood that for Massachusetts to thrive, it needed to have a thriving business and needed commerce. Mather was born 33 years after the Arbella speech. He was born 33 years into the colony and got to live so long that he not only saw the development of Harvard College, now Harvard University, he went there and graduated from there and became a reverend there along with it. And he became a reverend alongside his father, the debatably more famous author, Increase Mather, who just happened to be president at Harvard, where his son eventually went to school. Winthrop had wealth. Matter, Colin Matter, had access. He had family ties. His dad was already a minister and was president of the university he would go to. We are not going to do bootstrap logic here because, again, it's not as if Winthrop somehow had only hard work to earn his money. If you're getting wealth, that access to wealth is also based on certain privileges that you are able to get either out of sheer muck or out of your identity. And I'm kind of extrapolating a bit, but with Colin Matter and given how he conducted himself in this writing, I'm making a lot of assumptions about him that this is a lot to do with legacy. It doesn't mean that there isn't already a talent for writing as part of why his literature persists, but another reason his literature persists is because of his infamy, and he wouldn't have become so infamous if not for his family history. Increase Matter, his father, was investigating witchcraft, and he believed it was real. He even witnessed and wrote about the trial and execution of one of his fellow ministers, George Burroughs who was executed for witchcraft and for conspiring with the devil. This story is included in Colin Mather's book, but we'll get to that. Okay. So, Increase Mather, President of Harvard, Minister, Writer. Colin Mather, son of Increase Mather, Minister and Writer as well, but very much a historian. He's not trying only to write about the witch trials. He's trying to document the history of the Christian settlements and Harvard College in his book, Magnalia Christi Americana. But Magnal Magnalia also covered witch trials. And it would appear in more of those witch trials dominated the text we're signing today, Wonders of the Invisible World. In that book, Wonders of the Invisible World, he told the story about George Burroughs, the guy who used to work with his dad. And it was that book that also talked about Mark the Carrier, which is what we're reading today. What makes Con Mather's book stand out is what it says about some of the initial steps in what would become the United States with a fixation on forensics. In this case, it was Mather's obsessing with this idea that the evidence in front of us can prove that the accused are actually engaging in witchcraft. Mather is an odd case because we want to look at him as being of a scientific mind. And if I had included more excerpts of his writing, maybe that would be more apparent because the Marta Carrier trial is one of his worse types of writing because of how one-sided it is, but we'll get to that. Matter is trying to act like he's all about the scientific method, and he was trying to back that up with what else he was working on in his life. 
he actually advocated for inoculation as a way to treat smallpox. We can see Mather trying to embody a similar scientific method here in this text. Consider the passage where Mather goes into detail about the numerous medical dilemmas plaguing that one person named Benjamin Abbott. And then Mather goes into detail about all the problems Abbott is going through with his physical health. And once Carrier is arrested and imprisoned, suddenly, says Mather, Abbott is all better. Mather wants this to be true. And he picks this coincidence as if it is evidence. It's not, here's one piece of evidence, here's one piece of evidence, and leads to this logical conclusion. It is no. The fact that it went away as soon as she left and was arrested, that is the evidence. He is not tracing evidence to a conclusion. He is suggesting that conclusion that once she left, he got better, that's the evidence that she must be a witch. This is not simply, well, medicine wasn't good back then, so of course Matter and everyone else fell into this trick. This is not about treatment so much as cause, and the cause was determined to be outside of a natural order of illness. That's why Matter calls his book about invisible wonders. That's not only we can't see with the naked eye the illness that is spreading, even though he knows there are illnesses spreading. Like, if you're interested in inoculation for treating smallpox, you understand there is an invisible wonder at work, but it's something communicable. It's not simply witchcraft alone. There is an illness being spread. We're going to talk more about smallpox and how that ties into Martha Carrier in a bit. Okay, so Matter is supposed to be a scientist, and yet despite the scientific basis, Matter's text about Carrier is decidedly one-sided. Notice how in the excerpt we read today, we get the accusations made against Carrier, but not how she defended herself. Why do you think Matter refuses to show the other side? Is he really that committed to his argument that witchcraft has infested Massachusetts that he's not willing to entertain all evidence that may or may not put his claims into doubt as concerns this woman? All he offers is to say he would gladly retract anything he got wrong, quoting Matter, quote, And I shall report nothing but with good authority, and what I would invite all readers to examine, while tis yet fresh and new, that if there be found any mistake, it may be as willingly retracted as it was unwillingly committed. This book was published in, what was it, 1693? That was one year after the Carrier trial. Carrier was executed in 1692. If you have reported nothing but with good authority, and you are claiming all of this that you are offering readers is fresh and new, how on earth is something one year later fresh and new? I mean, just think for a moment what I had said about Edgar Allan Poe and publishing. I had talked about how Poe was trying to anticipate trends in literature. It's why he was so fixated on the idea of a premature burial and why he was able to get that published in Godey's Ladies Book because, hey, premature burials, being buried alive, was a popular story in the news, so put that into this Ladies Book and it will get readers because that's a current topic. If a trial has ended, how is your evidence fresh and new? I mean, think about what that says about the publishing world back then. Something could be published and it could be about events from a year ago and still be considered fresh and new. Yeah, meanwhile, an hour after news breaks, it's already old news. And a day after something is on Twitter, it's old news and we move on to the next story. And then matter persists. If there be found any mistake, oh, I don't know, like the fact that she wasn't a witch, it may be as willingly retracted. Martha Carrier is dead. 
retracting, getting something wrong is not going to bring her back. Oh, and we would be remiss not to mention how Matter wraps up this text. He ends his account by referring to Carrier as she was already condemned by his own judgment as, quote, the rampant hag. Okay. When I ask those two questions at the beginning of today's class, question one, where do you see legal acumen or forensics in Matter's writing? And question two, how should we regard gender in this text? I think we can conclude that, yeah, Matter, by our, from his own standards, is not acting as we would hope. I don't even mean by our standards. I mean by his. How can you look at... I mean, I'm not putting myself in the position of what is going through the mind of a community trying to figure out how are people dying, how are people dealing with so many medical dilemmas and wanting an answer, and how maybe religious fundamentalism was getting in the way of thinking logically through what actually happened. It's easy to sit where I am and make fun of this when someone 400 years in the future can look at my behavior and say, oh, I can't believe he thought in that time period that eating that food would be the best options for his health. Like, we don't know the kind of scientific advancements we may find in the future, but I would hope that I can look at the evidence in front of me and analyze it logically. When you have no other evidence in front of you and are familiar with inoculation and what that does for smallpox and then tie that into what we're going to talk about in a moment about well what exactly did Martha Carrier do that matter isn't covering that will explain this obsession with wanting to convict her as a witch and it has to do with smallpox this isn't just oh matter didn't know better this is matter having on a set of blinders that says this is the attitude i am taking i am looking at this from the perspective of we know witchcraft is real we know what we can pull from the bible as our evidence maybe this kind of forensics in his time period was considered to be sufficient evidence maybe in his time this was legally appropriate to not quote the defense's side. That, of course, by publishing standards, you don't include what the defendant says. You only include what the accusations were and what the evidence was against them. But, maybe there's something else here. I mean, yeah, Matter referred to Carrier as the rampant hag. Maybe Matter meant another definition of hag, which, even back then, the word hag was used as a generic term for witch. Nothing as awful as what our time period says. But when you are reducing someone with such flimsy evidence to just a witch, just a hag, how are we to read this as not having a gender bias within it? We'll talk more about that next week when we get to Mary Rowlandson, but just let's leave that question hanging for a moment. We had to consider what else was happening at the time Matter was writing. You can review the history of witch trials to see potential motivations for why you would accuse someone else of the crime of witchcraft. Maybe revenge? Maybe you want their lands? Maybe you're jealous of their position in office. I mean, I don't know if that's the reason George Burroughs was executed because he seemed to get along well with Con Mathers' dad, Increase Matters, so I don't think it was just jealousy. In any case, if you do pull it off, you can get someone convicted and executed. You are getting someone killed for the crime of witchcraft and making contracts with the devil we had to talk about who was martha carrier she was the child of one of the first settlers of andover massachusetts so 
For lack of a better phrase, she was a first-generation American. She was born in the future United States, just like Common Matter was. These are not people coming from Britain. These are the first people born on the continents within that settlement. Obviously, not the first people ever born on North American continents, but the first people within this settlement. In 1688, her family contracted smallpox, you know, the thing Common Matter was researching and inoculating for. Not all of her family survived. While her family was suffering from smallpox, they had to stay at home, away from other people. So you're not engaging with the community. You are separated from other people. In 1692, four years after they contracted smallpox, which, based on Con Mather's own writing, I guess was still a new and fresh development, it was in 1692... Four years after they had contracted smallpox that Martha Carrier was accused of being a witch. I am admittedly unclear on all details, given that Matter himself isn't giving enough either because won't even present her side of the story. From what I've read, it seems to be in part a connection to how so many people in Andover had died of smallpox and yet not Martha Carrier. As you read in Mather's text, her children were imprisoned with her. She and her children were moved from Andover to Salem, and one of the judges at the Salem trial of Martha Carrier was a man by the name of John Hathorn. And I'm kind of emphasizing the pronunciation as Hathorn because keep that name in mind. That is indeed the ancestor of Nathaniel Hawthorne who would write in the Scarlet Letter about the infamy of being related to Hathorn and why the Hawthorne family changed their name. That wasn't just because it rolls off the tongue more easily, it's also, we want a little separation from the fact that one of our ancestors was a judge at the witch trials. Like, even in the 19th century, when Hawthorne was writing, he was a little bit aware of how compromised his family was being associated with witchcraft, even though Hawthorne, or rather, association with the witch trials. Even though Hawthorne in the Scarlet Letter is talking about how I am just a mere author of fiction, I'm not a judge and a minister like my ancestor was, and it's like, yeah, but you're also making it clear that you're using false modesty to act like your writing's not as good as the accomplishments of your ancestors, thereby simultaneously trading on the name of your ancestors and suggesting that your own writing is as much an accomplishment as anything they did. And there's the fact that Hawthorne did write, I believe, about the Carrier trial, and Hawthorne did write Young Goodman Brown, which is about the plague of witchcraft and how it's actually an allegory for how instead of accusing other people of sinning, maybe you're doing so because you're actually afraid that you're a sinner or you're afraid that you are not embodying the expectations of your religion. There's a lot in here that we're not going to get to because we're stuck with just a transcript and I'm trying my best not to move away from the primary text for today's discussion. So, I guess the point I'm trying to make is, is that what happened to Carrier seems to be we don't understand what smallpox is doing. Common Matter thought inoculating, having shared community, having engagement and interaction and access to it might help cure people the carriers were barred from being around other people while contracting smallpox because they wanted them to be held in isolation for everyone else's safety and yet that was used against them to suggest well other people got sick and died but she didn't, so there must be something that she did to spread the illness. It's just bizarre that you are 
the subject to a good plan, that being we need to contain this virus and one way to do that is to be in isolation so you don't spread the virus but then that turns into oh well you survived it which means you must be a witch and we're going to pretend that you infected other people with other illnesses with witchcraft and then we're going to execute you let's try to wrap this up we haven't done much of a close reading today there is a reason I include the Martha Carrier text in a syllabus, so if you are teaching these authors, there is a set of goals I had in mind for including the Martha Carrier text. And it's much more as a historical document to clarify what were the Puritans like, but was also to point out how, if not for common matter, we wouldn't have a lot of this other literature. And you can see on the slide I use the phrase sets up future authors. Mary Rowlandson was before Common Matter, so I got that timing wrong. I will clarify how it is more so setting up future authors that are discussed in the class as well as authors who literally came after. So I apologize for my poor phrasing, but let's get back to the script. How is this all relevant today? I had asked on Tuesday for you to think about how we can read forward references to witches and witchcraft in today's pop culture. Arthur Miller's The Crucible is hardly recent literature, although given that Common Matter thought that things a year ago were fresh and new, I mean, time is a continuum, so whoa, well, I know. And the fact that Arthur Miller's The Crucible is still applicable in terms of seeing it as that allegory that Miller was writing about how the House Un-American Activities Committee of his time was using flimsy evidence. Granted, at least that was under oath. However much you can still lie under oath when no one can prove what you're saying is otherwise a lie. It was a modern day witch hunt. And we've heard witch hunt thrown around by a certain right-wing political party that hates to be held accountable for the things we saw them do, like tearing apart the country to sell for scrap or storming the capital on January 6, 2021. I wrote this on Twitter. I didn't time this discussion today to be at the same time as the January 6 hearing, the last one before the midterms. That stuff, that's not a witch trial. That's being held accountable for what we saw you do. There's no mass delusion there. We saw it, we heard it, you bragged about it, you led an assault against democracy in this country. I hope you all go to prison. But that's me being political again. Let's get back on topic. The fact that Common Matter and the Witch Trials gave us those words like witch hunt. That's not why this text is still relevant today, at least not the only reason. We also have to consider how this kind of story and the forms it takes still persist in later writing. Section 1 of this class was about here are some notable authors in American literature that are always canonized, and it's Washington Irving, Herman Melville, and Edgar Allan Poe. We wouldn't have their writing if we didn't have a common matter. If we didn't have a know-it-all acting like I didn't get this wrong, you wouldn't have Washington Irving creating a Jeffrey Crayon and a Dietrich Knickerbocker who can fall for the most obvious lies and believe, yeah, Rip Van Winkle slept for 20 years, it totally isn't that he ran away from home and then came back once he learned his wife had died. You wouldn't have Herman Melville writing Benio Sereno the same way without having Colin Matter's text here as a courtroom transcript so that Melville can use that same approach to lend a sense of authority and history to his text. We wouldn't have Edgar Allan Poe's hoaxes without texts like Common Matters. You wouldn't have Poe writing about a premature burial that didn't really happen and just making stuff up. And because I get the two mixed up, despite my best work, 
Edgar Allan Poe wasn't the only person to write hoaxes in his time period. Mark Twain did the same thing, only about a hot air balloon where he was trying to act like it really flew this far and around. You wouldn't have authors trying to appeal to this idea that Americans can be so easily deceived by what they read without doing a little digging and a little critical, a little critical thinking to figure out, yeah, this sounds convincing, but is it actually true and what are the motives behind it? This fixation on it's in history, so it must be true. This insistence on what we see must be true is still with us in United States writing. You wouldn't have this pushback against trying to acknowledge that slavery did happen in this country if you didn't have people falling into a mass delusion that American exceptionalism, America can do no wrong, and these people want us to just fixate on what is wrong with America instead of just moving on. You can't move on without acknowledging what you got wrong and constantly trying to get better at what you're doing. You don't say, well, if new evidence comes around, I will retract what I said. That's not good enough. You're having to make amends to be a better researcher and say, the next time I do this, I will get better at it. And when it comes to, here's how I thought these women in these witch trials were actual witches, we're seeing in Mather's text this expectation of what roles women had in Puritan society and given the accusations that Martha Carrier's kids were also witches, this idea that somehow women in these Puritan settlements were responsible for the development of their children, including a fall into contracts with the devil. Now, as I said, Mary Rowlandson's text came out before Colin Mathers wrote this. Mary Rowlandson's text was published before Martha Carrier's trial. So when I said future authors, my screw up, but we do need to get through Colin Matter first to understand the context in which Mary Rowlandson was writing. We can't approach Mary Rowlandson without this awareness of how women could be viewed during the Puritan time period. We're no longer in Winthrop's model of Christian charity, of being one body. We are now at a point where if you are suspected of being an outsider of being infected, of being different. You're susceptible to accusations. And Mary Rowlandson had to write her account to defend herself should she be seen as now an outsider, a potential traitor in so many senses of the idea of being a traitor and how that tied into not only a sense of community belonging and legal belonging and which nation you're a part of, but also sexualized, gender-based, and racialized treachery. But we're going to get to that next time. We'll wrap up here for today. Thank you for listening to today's review of Colin Mather's trial of Martha Carrier. What other questions come to mind when you look at what Colin Mather wrote? What comes to mind when you consider how witches have persisted as this popular conception in our media and as a shorthand phrase for people trying to fight unfair or what they think are unfair accusations in politics. I'd love to know where else you've seen witchcraft or the Martha Carrier trial pop up in any modern works. Modern not being fresh and new, modern being whatever you've encountered in the last number of years. I would love to know. Drop your questions in the comments section or email them to me, derek.s.mcgrath at gmail.com. I will address questions before or during the Section 2 review about the Puritan authors, which will be here on YouTube and Twitch on Tuesday, November 8th. Time to be determined. I'm considering whether to stick to 11 a.m. EST or for international viewers, go with 10 a.m. EDT. Your thoughts in the comment section are appreciated. 
Next time, we continue discussion about Puritans in early America. We are going to be reading Mary Rowlandson's 1682 accounts of her own kidnapping by the Narragansett, Wampanoag, and Nashaway captors in her book titled Sovereignty and Goodness of God Being a Narrative of the Captivity and Restoration of Mrs. Mary Rowlandson. You can read her text online at Gutenberg.org. Link is in the video description. On screen, you can see an illustration of Mary Rowlandson from one of the editions of her captivity narrative. As you read Rowlandson, please consider these three questions. Question one, how is this a work of literature, despite being told by a real-life person about real-life events? Question two, do you think it's appropriate to do a psychological reading of the real-life Rowlandson based on what she wrote in her own account? And question three, in which ways is Rowlandson being sympathetic or antagonistic to her Native American captors? Thanks again for joining this live stream. If you enjoyed this live stream, please consider a monetary contribution on coffee.com slash Derek S. McGrath. Your financial support helps keep me working in education. Until Tuesday at 11 a.m. EDT, I've been Derek S. McGrath. You have a good afternoon. Bye.